sure uh, we at least get some of the administrative proceedings started. I'll call the meeting to order. We have minutes from May the 7th. Does everyone have a chance to review those or were there any changes? Make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll get started with Steve uh, Manick, who's going to be talking about our road projects. <coughs> we really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Well, what I have for you, I, I, I'll talk about how we get some of our road and funding, some of the projects we have planned. I'm going to pass out this. You've seen that before, haven't you? Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I'm going to pass this around, and we're not going to go over this, but this just shows you the complexity of trying to get a federal dollar out of our federal government for a road project. Um, basically, most, most, if not all, of the City of Edmonds road widening projects are funded by the, what's, it's the, called the MPO, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization. It's called ACOG, the Association of Central Oklahoma Governments. So all of our motor fuel tax money that we pay, when we get gas, it goes to the federal government, it comes back to the state. Most of it goes to the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, but approximately 10% 10 10 of what comes back gets set aside for the Oklahoma City metro area for what's called local matching federal funding. So in other words, about, for round numbers, let's say $20 million is available each year for every, every member city to, for lack of a better word, fight for. And by member cities, I'm talking Norman, Oklahoma City, Midwest City, Yukon, Moore, Spencer, Oklahoma City, Yukon, Edmond, Guthrie, not Guthrie, but, well, Guthrie, yeah, all of them. Uh, there's so many, I don't even know how many is in there, but uh, there are a, a tremendous amount. And it's not a, a, a political-based <clears throat> organization it is a it's a warrants base so in other words it's whatever project <coughs> ranks highest on the list gets funding for that year and you get what we call points based on volume to capacity so if you have a whole lot of traffic that's out there at Cobell and sooner right now we have a capacity issue we have too much volume we have an ADT issue so we get a lot of extra points um, unfortunately if there's a lot of accidents we get extra points because that's something that needs to be corrected uh, road condition if it's really bad shape like most of Cobell because of all the weather we've had over the last couple of years we get extra points for that and what it is 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 out of that 20 million dollars only one city can only get 56 percent of that each year that's the most you can get so it's about 11 or 12 million dollars give or take depending on the available funding which sounds like a tremendous amount of money but it's enough to do one project um, and with the costs that are continuing to go up, whether it's concrete, asphalt, just the, the equipment, the labor, the labor shortage, the, the, the costs are going up. So we try our best, and I used to have the numbers in front of me. I think it was about $90 million our traffic planner has brought in in federal funds to the city of Edmond in about the last 15 years. Um, and that is absolutely amazing. Without that money, uh, we would be saving up money for a long time to do one mile of roadway, a tremendous amount. So that's how we get most of our funding. If there's additional funding that comes up, we would love to have additional funding and we can go through all the projects we've got on our list and other projects that may come about that will kind of show you what needs to be done. This, if you got it in front of you, to get federal funding, first you have to come up with the project. So you have to say, hey, I want to widen Covell. Well, let me give you, for instance, I want to widen Cobell underneath the railroad tracks at Broadway. That project was envisioned in 1995. There were functional plans started in 1995. That project was built in, let's say, a few of us in that neighborhood over there, mm -hmm. 2010. So it took 15 years to get that project from concept to fruition. And it almost didn't come to fruition because as we were going to bid, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe said, oh, by the way, we want dual railroad tracks out here, and we only designed one. Um, that was only going to be a small year delay and about another $2 million worth of construction. So fortunately, we made some phone calls and had our uh, appropriate people make phone calls, and the project went ahead as it is, and it's, it's a one-lane track, and someday the Burlington Northern Santa Fe can widen that bridge out on Cobell. They can put in another track if they'd love to because they get to maintain that bridge, not the city of Edmond. Not all projects take that long, but for the most part, um, depending on how fast something needs to be done, it can take numerous years. 
each year city staff applies for those federal funds in December. So we submit all our applications, which are about this thick. All the metro <coughs> cities submit them to ACOG. ACOG goes through them and ranks them based on the points I was telling you, whether there's accidents, volume to capacity, all the other items. They're non-political. They are physical features of the roadway. And then in March, the ACOG as a whole gets together and shows, well, here's the highest projects on the list. So for instance, not this year, but last year, the number one project on the list is one y'all may have heard of down in Norman, the Lindsay Street area, which is about a 20 something million dollar project. And Norman was like, well, we're gonna get our federal funds and we're gonna max out those federal funds. So we're gonna overmatch. So they got their 56% then they're overmatching nine or $10 million, whatever the number is. The number two project on the list was Covell from Fairfax Boulevard to I-35. And if you've been that way at rush hour or in the morning, you understand why that road needs to be widened. It really needs to be widened very quickly. The problem is that's a $10 million project. So ACOG started looking at it and said, well, wait a minute, when we give 12 million to Norman, if we give 8 million to, Oklahoma, to Edmond, there's not enough money. We're gonna bump you off the list and take the third and fourth project. So we had to stand up and say, whoa, no, no, no. We'll go ahead and we'll overmatch from city funds. So it's a $10 million project give us your five million that's left and we'll spend another four or five of our own money to make sure we get that project done. And they said, okay, that's, that's fine, we'll do that. Well, we've been working on that and it takes a long time because then you have to do your plans. We've been waiting on, <coughs> and I don't know which box it is in here, but it's called environmental assessment. It took 12 months for the Department of Transportation to approve our environmental assessment because it has to go through the Federal Highway Administration, the Oklahoma Archaeological Society, the National Resource Conservation Service, and I can go through all the other federal agencies to widen a road. And it took a year. So since it took a year, we had the great idea of, well, oh, we're going to apply for this again this year with 8020. And ACOG politely said, you've got your $5 million last year. We're going to hold on to your $5 million, and you can overmatch, and don't apply for it again this year because we're not going to let you basically have it. I don't want to say anyone had it, but... Five million would have gone back to the pot from last year. They didn't want that to happen. So we are, we have been buying right of way for zero dollars. We've had the developers graciously been donating what we need out there because it's a, it's a it's a huge asset to them as well that get traffic passed. Um, we are in coordination with utility companies. If you can imagine, it's the easy ones. You have Edmund Electric, you have OG&E, AT and T. Cox Cable, Pedestal Oil, Oklahoma Natural Gas. I uh, found a 26 inch one oak gas pipeline yesterday that we were having to redesign our storm sewer around so we don't have to spend a million dollars to move that gas line. It's in private easement. Um, there's numerous other utilities that <coughs> have to be moved out of the way for the road. So we've been having utility conferences for them with them and it's gonna take them six months to get their plans turned back into us. And then it's gonna take four to six months for them to move out of the way. And once they're out of the way, then the Oklahoma Dep Department of Transportation will let that project, they'll advertise it and let it so then it can be constructed. So the, the design, we can get things designed incredibly quickly. And depending on how it's funded, we can move forward. If, if we use all city funds for a project, like uh, in the 2000 sales tax, we did second Bradbury, second Vista with all city funds. As soon as they were ready, we went out to bid, got the project done, we're out of the way. We didn't have to go through the environmental assessment and all of the, the hoops you have to jump through to to take care of the federal, all the federal agencies we deal with to get that, that tax money. So in, in a nutshell, it takes about a year to design, but we have to get it started to get it designed. And as you're, as you're getting it designed, you get points for the design. So we may, when we go through a list and we go through this list here, I'll tell you we have different projects scheduled in different years because we know where we're at with the design. We know that, well, we're gonna have to buy right away. We know that we're going to have to do utility relocations, and there's all these steps. So with each step, once we get the plans done, we get the environmental assessment done, we get an extra three points. Once we get the right-of-way plans done, we get three points. Once we get the utility plans done, we get three points. And all those points add up to move our projects up on the list. That's why ACOG, they only get funding for one year, but right now we basically have a four-year plan that we apply for. And each December we have to reapply. For the upcoming year so it's a it's a cumbersome process but it has brought in like i said 
around $90 million of, of motor fuel taxes back to the city. So it's a, it's a huge revenue source for us to build these projects. So that's kind of how we fund most of our projects. Uh, it is, it's time consuming. Um, you think it's, it's easy, we design it, we find out what utilities are out there, we have to move them. Well, normally we don't have the right of way to move them, so we get to go to each property owner and say, would you like to donate? Most of the time, people don't really like donating us property for free. I see, I knew I'd get a chuckle over here for that one. Uh, but, Extortion. Uh, it's, it's, we just ask. Uh, well, the most I can be told is no, and I get told no a lot. But um, we, we work with the developers. Sometimes if, if we need a certain amount and they're doing something, we can revise what we need to, to shrink things in if they're doing some grading work and some stuff to help out. So we, we try and work with our neighboring property owners as best we can and plant trees back or plant things to help offset the road that we're building. But it takes a lot of time. We can't move the utilities till we get the right of way. So if it takes a year to get right of way, the utilities aren't being moved. So as we go through these lists, you can see that there's just always moving targets and we have to keep that on track as best as we can. We can only do about one federal road project a year because of just the funding cost. Um, like this year, those of you that drive through 33rd and Broadway, that's gonna go under construction here, we hope within the next two months. And we want you to keep going that way. I visit every restaurant down there, my son loves vintage stock, and my, I can tell you all the places we go, we'll continue to go there. But that's gonna go under construction and that's about a $5 million project to widen that out take out the asphalt, put concrete in, and max out what we can do to that intersection to get traffic through. There's nothing else after this other than maybe helicopters to get through there. It's just we're, we're maxing out the right of way, we're maxing out the amount of lanes we can put in. So that one will be ongoing for a year. We have Cobell and Sooner, which ACOG held the funding for. As soon as we can get the right of way and the, or the utility companies getting started, which um, we're about to turn a few loose on that. Once they get done, we'll put Cobell and, and Sooner under construction, so we'll get you on both ends of the city. So I apologize in advance for the road construction you're going to experience if you go either one of those ways. So those are the, the two upcoming projects we have that are in the ACOG list. I've got a whole big list here of projects that we can go down that I can tell you that we have under design. I can tell you what year that we have them preliminarily scheduled using that federal funding. In the packet of information I saw that was provided uh, to this committee, it talked, there's other road projects on here as well that we don't have funded. We just, there are other projects that they need to be done. Um, and some of them we're going to get to. And, and so if you want, I'll go off this list first of what's, what y'all been provided. The intersection work at Santa Fe and Cobell and Bryant and Cobell, we have, I'll say 50% plans in. Um, we're going to change a little bit at Santa Fe. We've, we've determined that we can get two left turn lanes. If, you, if you're leaving the MAC and you want to go south on Santa Fe, I can get two left turn lanes to get you through there quicker. Uh, we can get a right turn lane off Santa Fe onto Cobell as well as left turns in all directions. So we're going to modify those plans a little bit. As soon as those plans get in, um, there's only one right of way parcel at that intersection that I need and I know who that property owner is. Um, so we'll give him a call if he's in town and see if we can't uh, can't work with him. Uh, Bryant and Covell, if you travel that way, which I do every single day, we want to put left turn lanes. Uh, we have no right of way. We have 33 feet of statutory right of way each side of section line. Um, a, a travel lane is 12 foot wide, so if you want to add half of a lane, that's 18 foot wide somehow. In that last 15 feet, I have to put the water lines, the phone lines, the cable, the gas, the electric, the bar ditch. It just doesn't work. There's not enough room for that. So we're going to have to acquire some right of way at, at Bryant to get those left turn improvements in. These are interim improvements to facilitate left turns with the signal light that are out there right now. We'll be able to turn that left turn arrow on and everybody can turn. It'll be a much better <coughs> operation. That one's just going to take a little bit longer based on, on the right of way. And there's more utilities in that corridor because it's more confined than out at, at Santa Fe. So a lot of, a lot of work is uh, being planned, a lot of work to come, and then, then after that, then the roadway gets to start. So we do a lot of, a lot of work. On the list, there was Sorghum Mill, which is in front of an elementary school. 
Uh, if you've been um, in front of these new elementaries when they come online on a two-lane section line road, you may as well just not go that way because they're going to be parked out there trying to pick up the kids. Um, that's what's happening. It's not happening that bad on Penn right now, but with a new middle school coming online, it's going to be bad. So we actually have been working with Oklahoma County on the Penn Avenue improvement, and we have an agreement that just went to Capital Projects Committee this past Tuesday. Tuesday. It will go to the City Council, and the county is actually going to widen Penn for us to provide left turn lanes and right turn lanes into the school to take that congestion away. So that is going to be done. Uh, if they're not out there uh, sometime next week starting to strip the ditches, the county will be out there if it will not rain uh, within about a week getting started on that. And they want to get that done before school starts. So we're taking care of that Penn Avenue one. And, you know, we had $500,000 there and um, 280000 is what we're going to pay for that. So we, we try and save and maximize money where we can. Another project that really doesn't show up on a list, and it, it's here, but is the Air Depot Covell. Someday there's going to be another big high school out there. And imagine Edmond North traffic out at Cobell and Air Depot on two lane roads. I, I don't even want to think about it. We have it under design. It's not in the queue anywhere because right now there isn't traffic out there. So I don't have capacity issues. I don't have accidents issues. So trying to get that high enough on the list to get federal funds for would bump another project. And we'll go through here and you'll see the projects we've got on the list, which this are all seven good. million. Is that city funded or is that with matching funds? Um, that seven million is probably um, matching okay. because it, it, just to be honest with you, it, it's a it's over ten million dollars a mile to widen a road, and if you have bridges, it costs a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, we find a utility like ONG that's in a private easement. And if they're in a private easement, the city is required to pay for them to move out of what is theirs. So we have to pay all their relocation costs. That's what gets very, very expensive um, when that happens. For instance, if you're familiar with the entrance into Hunter's Point on Kelly, when we were widening Kelly, we found a couple small 18-inch oil lines that cost a million dollars to, to move out of the way. Um, that's what it costs to move those big lines. So the smaller lines, the four-inch, you know, I, I just when I say hundreds of thousands, it's that's not a lot. I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's not a lot. On an 80-20 match, what does the, what does it, the percentage really end up being? About 50-50. It, it ends up being about, by the time you do the design work, so on a $10 million design project, you're going to spend uh, probably at least a half million dollars on engineering, surveying. Uh, depending on right-of-way, it could be a million dollars. By the time you move the private utilities that are out there, that could be another 600 to a million and a half, depending on the project. Then you put your 20% share in, which is of 10 million is 2 million. You add that together, we spent 5 million out of a $10 million project. So it, it, we save a lot of money doing that, but we still spend a lot of money going through that process. And again, since you can only get 56% in any one given year, it kind of limits what you do. I think that on average, if you average it out over time, I believe Tom Minnick, who's my traffic planner, has averaged a, we might not have a project for a year or two, but the ones we get are large and it average, we average about 30% of that available funding is about where we get. If you average it over that last 15 years, that's about what we get, which is huge. And it's because we have a lot of traffic, we have a lot of needs, and Tom's just really good at his job filling out those things. So uh, we, we love Tom. He's been here 30 years, so he knows what to do. Um, I know, Logan, I don't know what to do with it. Um, the, there's, there's other projects that, that people don't understand. Second Street, we have a lot of traffic. We have UCO, we have all the commuter traffic, and everybody would probably think that Bryant's the critical cog in the wheel or Broadway. It's really not, and that's why this project says add turn lanes at Boulevard and Second. When we look at our, our time of day plans and our timing, there is so much north-south traffic on Boulevard, and it's so close to Broadway in order to give it enough time, we're, we're killing the Second Street corridor. But if we don't give it enough time and we give it all to Second Street, Boulevard backs up and you love getting those calls. That I sat here through three lights and can't make it through. Um, yes, we need more capacity. And, and the capacity is the turning movement. It's those left turning movements. For instance, right there where the little Statue of Liberty is, um, that left turn lane is almost filled up 
all the time. And you back out to the through traffic. So if you're the 10th car back, just go straight and turn the left at 15th because you're not going to make that left turn out. We can't get enough time to get you through. So if we could put dual left turn lanes there and, and move the Statue of Liberty, no. I mean, nobody's attached to the Statue of Liberty. We won't hurt her, we'll move her. Um, and then do the same thing on the other side. That would help tremendously. We can't really do much on 2nd Street because we have a church and I think a law office and a Jiffy Lube and Taco Bueno. Taco Bueno. You know, house. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's so many things there that um, I think that just trying to, I think we would impact, specifically say the Taco Bueno, they would no longer have a drive through And I don't think that's economically feasible for a fast food restaurant. So we can do what we can do. Yes, sir. Have you looked at the proposal in the downtown Yes. About redirecting and everything, and we, what, we've, what are your thoughts on that? Um, it's an interesting concept. There's still a lot of issues that would have to be involved with that, and it still includes additional turn lanes at at uh, Boulevard because you really would need two right turn lanes now because all the traffic that's being focused. So that's where it gets even a little more problematic. Of it's not lined up correctly, so then you start trying to move. And you can you can shift a lane like you've gone through second and Kelly it's it's offset about four or five feet but if you try and shift it ten feet which is what some of those lanes would do um, as you go through there you're just going to be hitting the, somebody and it, it just doesn't work uh, so there's there's operational issues and streets that would need to be closed in the <coughs> capital view addition which then affect how public services get in there and fire and police it's an interesting concept and we it, it's something that could work but right now we're more into the, the traffic on 2nd Street that's there with the designs that we have. So I don't think it would be a waste of money. It would, it would still be needed. We would, it would take a lot of lane configurations and restriping and repaving to make that. I forgot what the name of that darn thing was in there. There was a, an interesting name on. Couplet or something. Yeah, the couplet. Thank you. <laughs> the couplet. We haven't done a couplet yet. So. But um, I guess if you, add, if you adding additional left turn lanes is, all, is within the right of way. So. Right. I mean, it wouldn't affect long term what you. No, that, that's, that's have, like you said. You'd have to do some major realignment to do right. the couplet. Major realignment and, and some other issues there. So we that's something that can still be done because if we've got the pavement out there, I I love pavement because if you've got the pavement, you put traffic on it. But there's only so much pavement you can put, and we're we're about to max that whole area out with pavement. Mm -hmm. After that, you know, ITS is another project. Well, that is on my list, not necessarily in here is not the savior of everything. I mean, but for instance, um, I was out today on Boulevard and, and Ayers, and the lights turned green for Ayers traffic, but there was no car. So that's a problem. If there's no, why am I stopping on Boulevard if there's nobody coming? And this happens more often than not. Did we have a fire truck come through and he's got, we give the fire department access. They have little Opticoms that turn the lights green to get them through. People don't mind waiting at a light if they see a fire truck come through. Then the light has to recycle and it takes a couple cycles to get it back to where it was. But people can live with that if they see a fire truck come through. They don't like it just pulling up to a light and not get to go. Um, that could be a failed loop. It could be all sorts of things. And with intelligent transportation systems, that's going to be fiber optic back to our office with people monitoring the situation. If we have something happen that shouldn't happen, in other words, it didn't phase all the way through and there was no a uh, hot call for the fire truck, there's something that went wrong. So we're trying to get rid of the loops in the pavement. Everywhere we have loops except for 33rd Broadway, although we have a couple out there. They go bad. They get hit. Somebody digs them up. Lightning fries them. There's all sorts of things that happen. So we can go away with those and go to a, an infrared system with our, they look like cameras, but it's an infrared system. And we'll have a video camera there as well to, to determine what's going on at the intersection. Then we'll know what needs to be fixed. So when we call the traffic technician, we can say, hey, controller such and such is, is not working, you need to go do it, instead of him showing up saying, I don't know what happened, there's nothing in here to tell me, and he has to sit there for an hour trying to figure out what's going on with the signal. So ITS is going to help. If you've come north on, on Broadway, again, some on Boulevard slash Broadway, you love it when that AT&T truck set, stops right there at the corner by the Graceland Cemetery, he's right on the presence loop. So when he's parked right there, it's maxing out the green time for north-south, even though nobody's coming and everybody on Danforth is backing up. Those are the kind of things that we can see. Why is this maxing out at 8 o'clock in the evening when there shouldn't be maxing out? <coughs> we can real-time change the signals at that time and, and make it efficient, more efficient. We're going to make them more efficient is what ITS is, is going to do. So 
kind of skipped off my list, but um, I-35 Fringe Road development, um, we're making a few minor striping changes at 15th Street, or we're about to. If you're getting off going northbound, there's just one lane. We're going to give it two lanes to turn back to the west, kind of double that capacity. Um, it's all we can do right now. So we have actually are working with the state, the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, to fund um, an I-35 corridor study. There's things that ODOT wants to do out there. There's things that the city probably needs to do to evaluate those frontage roads and the off-ramps to make them function better, but it's very expensive. So ODOT is working on coming up with a scope. We, we actually had a scope and sent it out and had the engineer send it back in what it was gonna cost, and it was about $800,000. So we visited with the state. Um, we both agreed that they could probably take the lead on that, cut that cost down maybe almost in half, uh, and get the same thing out of it because of just some things. They're, they're better experts at the highway system than we are in their frontage roads. So we've, we've got some good partnerships out there to try and save some money but still get what we need done. But that study is going to show things that need to be done. Those interchanges, 2nd Street doesn't function well. 15th Street doesn't function well. And what needs to be done? Are they, are they uh, one-way frontage roads? I don't know. Are they mid-block uh, bridges or bridges up next to the existing bridges to make a U-turn to go back the other way, a free-flowing U-turn like at 63rd Street and, and what they've done on Broadway? There's lots of things that can be looked at and done to try and maximize what's out there for that peak traffic that we're getting. Um, so that's the out 35 uh, frontage study. Now, if you want to turn on the, the map, we can talk about Cobell and kind of show you what, what we've got planned and just add there for a Okay. Thank you all for coming this evening. <laughs> How much do you um, stopped trains contribute to the, the traffic? We love stop trains. <laughs> They're the best. Um, <laughs> the, the, the problem that we're having, and Larry has, uh, this has been a very hot topic here lately because there for a while, we didn't have any trains. We had 10 trains, 15 trains a day. The trains weren't coming. Now the conductor says we have 80. Uh, I don't know if we have 80 every day or if it's on the peak days, mm -hmm. but for some reason, there is always one in downtown Edmond at 7, 7.30, and then one around noon, and it's parking because there's double track. They pull off to the side and let the other train pass. Mm -hmm. That's why they're parked there. They're not offloading anything. They're letting somebody else pass going somewhere. And there's, that's why they'd like to double track but they'd love for maybe somebody else to participate in that. And it is a hugely costly mm -hmm. enterprise to help the railroads try and double track. Um, Steve, you've got a question. Yes, sir. What, wouldn't it have been, <clears throat> if you had to do it all over again, wouldn't it be better to have taken, spent the $2 million to double the track on Cobell so that them trains could pass out there instead of having the, the traffic blocked up from east to west? on 10 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock? The problem is <coughs> their trains are 8,000 feet long, so... That's what I mean. Wouldn't Cobell be better? But it, it ties back in right after Cobell. They just wanted they could, us to build but it. they could have yeah. changed that, too. They could, the, but... The they, had the right of, they had the 99-foot right-of-way. They they, they, they've that. got a bunch, but they haven't approached us and said, we want to do that. So the issue is that when it happens, they can come and build. It won't take long for them to build. The, the, uh, the abutments were all built to be expanded. So it's not a big issue when the Burlington Northern wants to come and expand that. They just tie onto the existing abutments to one side and put their bridge across the top. Those trains set out for 30 minutes from time to time. Oh, they longer were than that. longer than that. I think we had five during the Arts Festival, and so okay. it was really compounded so in one day. The, the issue is they're, they, depending on, it's, we, we call them, Larry's very aware of it. do their own thing, mm -hmm. yeah. and they have been for 200 years. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, if we, if we, we they really don't care. They don't listen. We're, we're trying to work through the Corporation Commission to get some acknowledgement of this. In fact, we've been tracking the length and the number of times that our intersections are blocked in the last couple of weeks, so we can provide some documentation to the Corporation Commission. And actually, that's gone down some in the last week. We, they may have had some temporary repair they were working on someplace else, but the, the number of trains going to 80 and, and sitting there at least a half an hour. Some of them are longer than that. Yeah. If, it was up, if it was up to the BNSF, they would like to close every crossing in downtown Edmond. So 
Well, they did. Well, they, they do, <laughs> but they would like to close them permanently. Right. I mean, they really they they don't like them. Down. So there, there's some issues that, that you know, we can't tell them where to park. It's their tracks. So they, they are, there are numerous opportunities throughout their track system. Up near Guthrie, there's double tracks. South of Oklahoma City, there's double tracks. There's double tracks here. There's double tracks in many locations. Like Larry said, they do what they want to do. I've actually tried calling them to get hold of somebody. When I got hold of a secretary somewhere. They don't and she was like, want you to know who I don't know who you are. So they want you to talk to the local guy. They don't tell you who the corporate people are. They, it's, it's a different. Get Warren Buffett. <laughs> I, I'll give him. You might give me his number later. Uh, so I've already kind of talked about. Here's where the new high school is going to be at some point in the future. We think somewhere in the next five to nine years, which is Covell and Air Depot. I have to kind of backtrack a little bit on my, on my federal road dollars. You have to be on what's called <coughs> ACOG's federal functional classification list. And if you're not on that list, you don't get any federal dollars to widen that road. Air Depot is as far west or far east in Edmond that the federal functional classification goes. And in fact, it comes to right here. But since we have a project here eventually, it touches the limits. So since it touches the limits, we can extend this way and this way three quarters of a mile because it's still part of a project that is in where the federal functional, functional classification ends, which is Covell at Air Depot. So Air Depot isn't part of it. Well, here isn't, but Covell is up here. So that's why we will try and get that funded with federal funds or some other fund in the future. But, so we've got this project under design. The project I was just explaining that we're working on is from this on-ramp to uh, Mr. Armstrong's uh, development right here at the top of the hill. That's the, the, the best place to meet and match. Everybody would like for us to, to move and things, but you got to remember, we have, not all the roads are flat. So if the road does this and we have to make the road do this, we can't stop it out here where the existing road is 10 foot lower than where we're supposed to be. We have to have those logical termini. So the logical termini right now is the Fairfax Business Park, and then we taper down after that. So this is the project that ACOG held the funding on. We're going to right away. We're working with utilities. So from here to here, we have, have funded. We have Bryant under design to put left turn lanes on. And then if you want to go further, don't, don't just kind of, if you can, just pull this over where our depot is just kind of right here. Where it's possible. Where? Yeah, just All the way to the right. Yeah, keep going. You go a little bit. That's good right there. How far did I get? That got me good enough. So here's Kelly, which we just did. And this was because staff has been here for so long. And again, I'll, I love you, Tom Minnick, who's our traffic planner, who sits up there and, and gets all the calls for stop signs and traffic problems. Deer crossings. Deer crossings, yeah. <laughs> Take those darn signs down, too. Yeah. But, um, the Cobell and Kelly project, you know, we had a project here, and then we had one big one that went from here to here. The reason we had that is because over the last 10 years, not every city got their project done. So ACOG had this little bank account of about uh, 10 to $15 million. And they said, hey, does anybody have a project ready? <coughs> and five years before that, when we started the design of both Kelly and Cobell, we did it to federal standards. We bought right away for federal standards. We dealt with all the utility companies. We turned our plans into ODOT. Since we had done that, we had a shovel ready project. So this, we were going to get Covell, but we weren't going to get Kelly. Well, we were going to get Kelly, we weren't going to get Covell. But since we had the project ready, they had an extra bucket of money. The city of Edmonton gladly stepped in, did that as we had to tie the projects together through the bidding process. We got a free project. We still had to spend our, our 20%, but we didn't have to wait a year or two or three to get it. So we got all that pain done in one fell swoop, which was good because it would not, it's very difficult as you know, this, this project, this new project we just did stops up here because we couldn't do the intersection, it got too big. If your project gets too big, then you have to have again those logical termini. But again, so we, we try and do everything to where, to where if there's money out there and we can find it, we're going to use it. So we have Santa Fe, this is where I'm talking about, we have left turn lanes under design, but we're going to have dual left turn lanes this way and we're going to have a right turn lane this way. And we're going to have to widen part of Santa Fe for 1,200 feet, 1,500 feet with two lanes to taper down to one to get that traffic. Our problems aren't, our problems aren't here to here. Our problems are the intersections. So 
when you start trying to break a project out, if you don't have an intersection, you're, you're challenged to get those, those points. Um, you know, unless you have an elementary school or a middle school or a high school, then it, that helps because there's lots of pedestrians and things. Yes, ma'am. How about Thomas and Danforth? That's on my list. So let's start going down. So mm -hmm. Cobell, we have, again, let's say we have, we have one section under design. We have, I'm going to call it interim improvements, which is right here and right here. And after that, currently I don't have any money to build the rest of it. We have it under design, but we don't have the funding. So we don't have, west of Santa Fe, I don't have under design. So if somebody wants something done west of Santa Fe quicker, I'll have to get a, a design fee from the engineer that's designed everything else out here, and we'll get started on it. You got an idea on right away from uh, Boulevard and Fairfax? <sighs> a lot. Um, there are so many, there's these two acre tracks. Um, we only have 33 feet on the whole north side of Cobell. And even if we just, I can tell you the house that, uh, was that short? Um, that house is at 50 feet. I've talked to, I was Herman, I think, um, a few years ago. Um, so there, there's issues that we have to, to do to shrink in our sections. And we, we may be, we were already looking at trying to shrink lanes down. We'd like to have 12 foot lanes. We may have to go down to 11 foot lanes. And I'm going to give you an example here in just a second as to where some areas we're going to have to do that that you probably <coughs> drive through if you want to get a smaller car instead of a truck. Um, <laughs> so let me go down the list. There, there's, there's some gaps in Cobell. There are some gaps that we're looking at that the council has said we need something done. I think you all will provide some information as to what that permanent Did gap all of you get that material this week? Yeah, what we call a middle section. Yeah, which around. is from Fairfax That's to here, <clears throat> which is St. Mary's School. That is 30 plus million dollars. That's what it's going to take. And that's where it gets very difficult because it, I don't, there's not, didn't mind dealing with Mr. Sauger here because that's a half mile right away. But when you have to deal with 30 different <coughs> property owners and their fences and their sprinklers and their trees and their fortinias and their, it is. Possibly their house. No, we don't, we'll move away from the houses. Wow. But those are issues, and they are time-consuming, long, drawn-out issues, because we try and work with every citizen here in the city for, for all of our projects. So that is that 30 plus million dollar gap that we're working on. Uh, we're trying to split it into different phases and see how we can get federal funding, or if there's, again, if it rains some cash and we can go build something, we want to be ready to do that. Did you say 30 million was just for the right of way? No, that's that's 32 million is our estimate for that project. Okay. Now, if we don't, there, there's an issue, and, and y'all are familiar with this. That Coltrane intersection, it needs to be raised. The drainage work through there needs to be done. And there's that small little one oak thing. And I met with them, I'd say 10 years ago, and the guy showed me his easement, pretty much dated statement, and he told me, I'm not moving because there are gas lines coming from the north, from the southwest, and they go east. To move would probably cost more than that whole corridor itself. So there's things we have to design around, and that's one of them that we're trying to design around. But we still have to give them access down there to it. So it's difficult because they're in a hole. We need to raise the road, but still have to give them access down there to it. So it's, it's, it's challenging. So some of the projects, and we'll get to Danforth and Thomas in just a minute. In uh, 2018, we, the only year we care about is this year because we've applied for this year, our funding is this year. In December, we apply, for, we apply for next year. When we put something on the ACOG list four years out, it's a placeholder. It's to show that what we have to do is that when we do a set of plans, and this is kind of the ACOG list, and I didn't make a copy because y'all wouldn't understand, but you don't want this anyway, because this changes from month to month. We, we put it on here to get what's called a job number. When we get that job number from ACOG, ODOT will review our plans. If you don't have a job number and I send down a set of plans, it's 300 sheets, they take it and they go find the trash and it goes right in the trash because there's no reason for them to review it because that means it's five years out. Probably won't even be the same person reviewing it in five years. So if it's not in year one, <coughs> sometimes year two, if we, if we plead and beg, they'll review our plans. Because we can't move forward until ODOT signs off on our plans. Once they sign off on the plans, then we go by the right-of-way. 
then we can go move the utilities. But I can't move the utilities until ODOT sees all the easements that has their initials on it. And they won't, it's just, it's a long process. So, in 2018, we currently have the intersection of Danforth and Kelly, which typically ranks as our highest intersection accident site in the city. Because right. it's not necessarily the intersection, it's McDonald's and it's no. so low. Why do you try and make a left turn across five lanes of traffic at five o'clock at night when you can't <coughs> see it? It happens, and this is, people wonder why we build medians, and they is to keep people from hurting themselves. I mean, I, I actually, I was out there, and there was a girl driving, texting next to me, going, through the intersection. I'm kind of like, you're gonna, uh, anyway. <laughs> so, so there's things that, that is scheduled in 2018. Now that can move and change this is a project where, you know those big power poles that are out there? Those aren't going anywhere. Those are about a quarter of a million dollars each to move, maybe more. And you can't just move one because of the tension on the wire. So if you move one, you're probably gonna move about nine. So that could be a couple million dollars just to move those poles. So we've, we've learned what to design away from, which means we're gonna have 11 foot lanes through that intersection, maybe 10 and a half if I can't get away from that pole. Okay, Molly, just pull your mirrors in. So, but there's, we get creative on how to still get our projects done. You just have to slow down. We'll call it traffic calming, so slow down as you go through that intersection. You don't need to be going 45 through there anyway because somebody's going to turn in front of you. Um, another project we have a few years ago, um, again, the Department of Transportation inspects every bridge in the city of Edmond, and a bridge is anything that's 20 foot long. So that can be a series of culverts, that can be what's called reinforced concrete boxes, that can be span bridges. A few years ago, um, they, they found the bridge on Sooner Road, which is north of Cobell, about a half mile over Coffee Creek. It was a beautiful bridge, looks great. So you got down below, and it was so old, I think it was about 80 years old, and there were steel piles, or uh, wood piles underneath the buttress. The wood piles were basically rotted all the way out. So we had to do an emergency repair with some extra funding that we had, and recase that and, and do a bunch of work, because they made us close that bridge. Right now we have a bridge closed on, we just opened Anderson, and we've got to do, we're opening bids in 30 days on another bridge that's been undermined, that if we don't go fix it, they're gonna close that. So we really don't like having our section line roads closed to bridges that are um, deteriorating. But, so, but as part of that, that bridge, there's the steel beams are starting to rust, so we had to load post the Sooner Road Bridge. And basically it was, well, we'll let you do these repairs and open it. This was ODOT speaking, but you got to replace it within five years or we're going to close it again. So that's on the list to be done. Which one was the one with the railroad cars in it? Uh, that was uh, on Bryant, <coughs> just north of 15th. They were two railroad tanker cars with the ends cut off. Um, put them in there and paved over. Put them in there and paved over. And that was a project the 96 sales tax paid for within the last couple of years. And we put in two... I think they're 10 by 17 foot boxes to get the water through. Uh, I actually had people saying, oh, you don't need to do that, it's fine, it's fine, and I won't tell you what engineer said that, because everybody in here probably knows them. And then we had the rain the next year, and I got pictures of the car that's three foot underwater because the water went under the roof. So we took care of a safety problem. Um, and that was actually identified back in a 1991 drainage study by CH Tuam Hill, and it took till 2013 to get it fixed. That's how long it took to get the funding for that. So we try and take care of drainage problems and roadway <coughs> problems, if we can, if they're in the same corridor. And many times they go hand in hand, because the drainage, if it's that old, the road's that old, and you gotta replace them both. Yeah. So, so let's go to your favorite project, Danforth and Thomas. And my assistant design engineer, Steve Commons, back there. Um, unlicensed. Unlicensed, but, but we, we like him that way. Um, we are working on widening Danforth from, let's say, the other side of the Reeds Landing Apartments up to the railroad tracks. We're not gonna go over the railroad tracks. We're not gonna touch the railroad right-of-way because once you touch the railroad right-of-way, um, you're buying new railroad switches and those are were built in the 50s. Oh, by the way, those don't coordinate with the four we have on each side, so we're gonna replace all our switches. You're gonna rebuild our crossing, you're gonna rebuild our gates. We aren't gonna touch the Burlington Northern Santa Fe's right-of-way, is what I'm gonna tell you. So. With that, we will be able to get a left turn lane onto Thomas if you're coming eastbound. We'll change it up so you don't have to just sit there and take your life from your hands to get across. Um, we'll have a fifth turn lane. We'll have on Thomas, 
our plan is to make it a three lane street. I don't need four lanes because there's, it's just a through street, but it's got a school, it's got a lot of cars. So we'll have three lanes, which will have a lane each way, a center turn lane, and then we'll have right turn lanes into the parking lots of the school. Schools, we'll say schools and neighborhoods. Now, we still have an issue with pedestrians crossing and the school is planning on building more parking on the east side of Thomas. So we've come up with a sketch to show to the school which we're going to, which would, <coughs> Thomas would still be where it is today at Danforth, but it would swing out and around closer to the railroad tracks and then go due north and then swing back. There's just some operational issues on, we take out two thirds of the school's parking lot that's there. Um, but it's safer because we still have all those pedestrians crossing. That's nine months out of the year, but if we can take that away, that's it's something we're gonna, going to um, show the school if they would love to help participate um, in some fashion, whether it's buying right-of-way, giving right-of-way. The schools are, a lot of our problems are because of the school traffic. The schools have been very gracious and have donated all the right-of-way we need in our projects to be able to build the roads in front of them. So it's a, it's a good relationship and they've, they've actually contact city staff now. I'm actually on the committees when they interview their architects and engineers for new schools so I know where they're going and I can tell them, hey, there's not a water line out here or there's not a sewer line or there's going to be a traffic problem. So we, we've got good communication now. Um, they, they inform us as to what's going on. So we have a good, good working relationship. So we'll see if it's something they want to um, entertain. If not, then we're, we'll have to move forward with what we plan, which is leaving it as it is, and we'll have to address those pedestrians somehow. And I don't Do know you if that... have a timeline on that? Um, we're going to meet with the schools first, and Mr. Commons, I believe, is working on setting that up. They just went through their administration change, so uh, we'll meet with them. We already have it under design, so I'll, I can change the design if that's what they so choose, but they're going to need to give me some right away to do it. And they don't own all the right away that I need to do what's going to happen. So there's, there's, we're working on it. Um, we know it's a problem. It's not happening. It's not happening this year or next year. Um, unless again, a whole bunch of money comes and it's a project that we want to do then we can expedite that thing real quick. So this is through the funding, the federal funding process. Are there any opportunities for like a messaging system to tell you that, because what happens to me on Danforth going by the school is that I don't realize that there's a stop train at Danforth and then you get caught in the school traffic and the train and you're just <coughs> counting everything else that you can know back at there, some point that there's a train stopped in. There's lots of things that can be done with intelligent transportation systems. Mm -hmm. um, back in 2000 and, was that 2010 when we had our really, really good rains and my wife tried to leave home and tried to go down Bryant and couldn't, then tried to go down Kelbell and couldn't, and then turned around and came back home and just yelled at me for not calling her until the roads were under water. <laughs> they rained 10 inches, honey, I'm sorry. But intelligent transportation systems is such that if we had a road closure, we could post that on, on the internet. We could post it on our website. <clears throat> it, it could send out alerts if you applied to an alert. Intelligent transportation systems, there's a lot of things we can do with that. First off, I have to have some people to run it. I can't find any engineers, which we're interviewing next week. that are few and far between. But there's, there's ways that you can plan your route. It can show there's road construction. It can show that a road is closed. It can show there's a wreck. There's a way that, um, since we're gonna have cameras out there to detect the vehicles, you could get up and say, oh my gosh, there's a snowstorm at 33rd and Broadway and there's cars everywhere. I don't wanna go that way. There's a lot of things that it can do once we get there. We just have to get it. We're doing the first phase, which is 2nd Street from Saints Boulevard to the West City Limits. Once that gets online, then we'll see what all we can do with it. Mm -hmm. Right now, we want to just be able to coordinate the signals and change them real time. Right now, we, what we do is we take traffic counts and we say, okay, there's 30,000 cars a day going this way. They come in these increments, so we time a day plan. So about there's about five different times a day we run a different signal timing plan, whereas with ITS we can change in real time. Steve, okay, on, on Thomas Drive, it's a half mile road, it's not a section line road, I understand that, but why wouldn't you make that a four lane drive, road? When you've got 299 houses on one side, 185 apartment complex on the other side of the road, you've got two schools that maintain a lot of traffic, and you run right straight in, if you're north, you run right in through about 385 apartment complexes, uh, 385 units up there. I mean, I'll, I'll explain. Um, 
Santa Fe from 15th to 33rd Street. That is not in the city of Edmond. That is Oklahoma City's road. They fifth laned it. They did two lanes and a center left turn lane. I understand. Go watch the grass <coughs> grow in that center turn lane. Nobody uses it except at the intersections. So what we've decided is we, we, don't, have a, we don't have a capacity problem mid-mile. It's the intersections. So if we have it at the intersections and then at the school driveways and the other driveways, we can put a right turn lane. It'll go to four lanes right there. So the right turner can get out of the way and turn in. The center turn lane, they can turn left into Thomas Trails or whatever, but they're not blocking the through traffic. So what that is, is we're saving one lane for a whole mile of roadway, which is probably a million and a half bucks. Okay, I thought you said it was gonna be a three lane highway. It's gonna be three. It'll be one lane, one lane, center turn lane, and then we'll have turn lanes, like a decel lane at certain driveways that experience a lot of traffic. Okay, All right. So. I misunderstood. Yeah, sorry. So that, that's kind of, that's when we don't need four lanes. I, normally I'd say I'd like six lanes everywhere, but that's one that, that <laughs> we came to, to, to three. So um, there's, there's many problems. Second Bryant is under design. We've asked the state for funding on that. <coughs> it's a state highway. We'll see. Uh, 33rd and Coltrane, from I to, out to I-35, that's been under design for years. Our traffic is dropping. Unfortunately, I'd have very few accidents. It doesn't rank high enough on ACOG's list for me to get money. So I'd go, probably go widen that because I've got all the right of way, but I probably need to do Danforth and Thomas before I do that. So that's the other things we look at trying to program those. Um, I talked about Covell Kelly from, from uh, Coffee Creek North. From Coffee Creek to Sorghum needs to be widened to four lanes. From Sorghum North, we might be able to do with three lanes. We'll see. All you have are the two entrances or the three entrances to Oak Tree and then there's a cemetery. Got to avoid that cemetery at all costs. Um, anywhere where there's a new school coming, we're going to have to do some road work next to it. I know there's a lot of projects, but on the funding side of it, when do you put set the funds aside from the city? Like when the city matches, do okay. they just set aside that year yeah. or when it actually happens? We, we have to. What happens is, is, is ODOT, like if you look at, at the five-year capital improvements sales tax budget, out in year two or three or four, there's a big lump sum of money, say $4 million. Between there and here, there might be a half million and a million, which is where we're going to buy right away, move utilities, and then that's our matching share because we think it's going to be that year. And ODOT, we have to send them the money before they even advertise the project. We have to send them our 20% share so that they understand we're serious about the project because um, they don't want to go through the, project, the, the process of, of, of awarding a pro or opening bids and not, not awarding it. So basically the money has to be in the year we think it's going to be built. And that's a guessing game depending on if something comes up that restricts us from getting. Like 33rd Broadway was actually programmed a couple years ago. Um, but then we ran into right away issues. So there, we always have fun things on, on right away. I'll, I'll give you an example. 15th and Broadway. I need to put a right turn lane in front of Spar Starbucks and I need to extend the, the left turn lanes back and redo that paving. It's about a half million dollar project. Our share is $100,000. There is an Inajex gas pipeline that is a million dollars they, they want us to move to pay, pay to move. But that's not the only problem. There's a shopping center there that I need a small easement from. The property owner has said, I will grant you the easement. But when you have leasees, the leasees have to sign tenant releases because one of the tenants has a store in Florida that somebody cut through a parking lot and got hit. They will not sign the tenant release. How do I, how does the city condemn a tenant release? <clears throat> so I can't give a parcel, even though the owner has said, we'd love for you to move forward. So there, there are, oh, uh, yeah, I see you said it, I didn't say it. Um, the, those are the, some of the issues that we run across every single day, and it gets really just crazy. So that's what happened at 33rd Street as well. We had one property owner that didn't want to sign. He wanted to sign, and the tenant didn't want to sign. So actually, we redesigned and went away from him. And when you miss your federal funding queue, say, in 2012, you're already past the cycle for 13. You have to reapply for 14. So it's a two-year delay. If you miss that cycle one year, it's a two-year delay. In light of the fact that, you know, you're, you've mentioned previously on some of these intersections, you eventually max out. Um, has there been any analysis or discussion at the city level on, 
you know, requiring new developments to be grid style or, or doing things that are going to alleviate the congestion of the... The, the City Council has long talked about uh, connectivity and interconnecting between drives and, and neighborhoods. And even if it's public and private, you know, if a storm comes through, you still need a place to get out. So that is very, you know, unfortunately, if you pull up a map of Edmond, there's not a lot of area left to do that because it's this little community and this little community, and then Kimberly you got five acre lots. Prime example. What was that? Kimberly Crossing. Kimberly Crossing. Over there behind <coughs> the RBS Bank. It goes to another addition. They've got private streets, public streets. We have a crash gate back there if something bad ever happens, but they didn't. The, the, the people next door didn't want connectivity. They want people to cut through their streets. They fought it like you would not believe. Yeah, it would probably require <coughs> a code change. I mean, it'd have to be, and I understand. I'm just wondering if, if, there's, if there's been any serious analysis or discussion, or, or especially from an engineering perspective of, we don't think that would have much effect, or. Anytime you can get traffic going a different way. Yeah. The good help. I use every weird street in Edmond because I know it goes through here and there. Right. I just, that's, right. my wife's like, why are you kept like, trust me. So, time for us to wrap up the road. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, just so that's where we are. If you have any other questions, we got a lot of projects and they're on the list. They're on the city website for about the next couple of years. And if you have any other questions, just feel free and send me an email or call me. Whatever. Right. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you. you. And Chief Hall, are you ready to? You want to go on or you guys do? We had, we'd entertain the idea of it, it's up to you guys, of course, but he's he's willing to come back okay, if you guys um, were, are willing to do that as well. We don't want to yeah, keep you too long and don't want to sort of shortchange his time. Okay, on it, sure, so. it, it, it's up to you, though. Yeah, no, I mean, what are you guys ready to wrap up? How long is this presentation? Yeah, how long is your presentation? Probably 20 to 30 minutes. That's kind of what I planned on, but. So are you we guys good? can just give me some money and I'll go for it. <laughs> are we okay going to seven? Is there? <coughs> go for it. Why are you still last that long here? Is there anyone they can't stay till seven? Uh, uh, but I have to leave about ten till. So okay. It's no big deal. Do you need to get going? Yeah. Are you okay with us yeah. continuing on and the video oh, will still be going? Okay, great. Well, let's if, if that's okay, then let's go ahead and. We'll Get down by seven. Are you okay, Andy? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah. I just wanted to throw that idea out there. To see that. Yeah, I, do, I thought we were okay going to seven if we yeah. needed to. So. Yeah, well, that's, what we, that's what we discussed with her. Uh, that's what the video said. Was, yes. you know, if we need yeah. to, we will. But I don't yes. know if that's perfect. <laughs> that's fine. I know there's a power button up here. Yeah. I'll keep you out. You turn that off. <coughs> okay, good. Good evening. I'm trying to turn this off. Sorry. Hold it down. There you go. Okay. Uh, Deputy Chief Dins handing out some handouts. and give you my little bit of thing. I, I forgot to hit color, and we were in a hurry getting over here. This we got held up in class. So my handouts aren't in color, which I really wanted them to. But what I wanted to go over. Everybody has our list of the, the capital projects, the long-term capital projects that was turned in uh, back in uh, 14. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about those and the priorities as we see it. With the fire department, our, our big thing is all based on response times and, and how quick can we get to emergency scene. So we, the first page there that I hand out, and this uh, talks about distribution. This was done by a study that we had in 2013 by independent agency, agency that came in and kind of took a look at where we're at currently and what they projected our, our, our current or our future fire stations to be located. So as we kind of go through these, and again, I apologize, they're not in color, it, it shows our current fire stations, the second page there. The big thing with us is, is we want to get to the scene per NFPA standards within five minutes of, the, of receiving a 911 call. That gives us 60 seconds to, to receive the call at dispatch, get to our fire trucks, get out, and a four minute drive time. Um, that's NFPA standards and that's what we're, we set our goal at. We don't always achieve that and especially in some of our outlying areas, it, it's, it's very difficult. And Steve already left, especially with Steve's roads. Um, <laughs> so, just teasing on that, but that's got to pick on him. So, you know, currently we have the five fire stations in Edmond. Um, our, our 
volume of calls, um, which is on page three, is you'll see and is more centrally located. It's in the core of what everyone considers Edmond. Um, you know, map page 28, 29, right there, Station 1, UCL campus, uh, staggering down through Station 2's district there, Broadway, and then uh, southwest into, um, you know, into that area. So those are the, the majority of our calls. We are seeing more increased calls out to the east, obviously, as, as the housing additions creep out that way as the infrastructure gets there. We are seeing more uh, um, more calls out there, but it's still the volume of our, our current calls are in town. Um, when we did our study, they projected that we did, they, they plugged in a fire station number six, it's page uh, three, sorry, yeah, page three, the Edmond Fire Department future distribution. You'll see uh, at the top, it's at Coffee Creek, and uh, they, they projected it at Bryant. Um, is where they had plugged in that and that they based that based on the travel time how quick uh, can we get to those areas and then also the volume <coughs> calls in those areas currently and i'm kind of bouncing around here currently we have the land purchased for the station six at kelly uh, in between uh, sorghum mill and waterloo or excuse me get it right here coffee creek and sorghum mill just north of cross timbers elementary right. Uh, we have the, the land purchased for Station 6. It was purchased in 2007. Um, so we, ha we have that land and we're, we're waiting on that. Um, we're watching those calls kind of continue to increase in those areas. And um, when that timing is right, we would like to go ahead and build that fire station up there. It will relieve some of the calls at Station 3. Station 3 has slowly crept up to be, um, it's, it's still our third busiest engine company but it is right there neck and neck with stations one, two, and one and two. They, they are all pretty close on the volume of calls. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing a lot more of is concurrent calls where this, the rig's already on one emergency call in their district and then a second emergency comes in. And when that happens, of course, we, you know, station one may backfill for station two or station two will be backfilling for threes. Anytime we do that, we get, uh, <coughs> did you get it? Well, oh, you're a master. Um, if any time we do that, obviously we have a little bit longer response time. So the, the new student, Mandy's going to fix me up here. I emailed him this deal so it's in color so it makes a little more sense to you. Um, the Station 6 is, is definitely going to relieve some of those issues. One of the other in a, issues or one of the other high priorities for us is relocation of fire station number 2. Uh, station 2 is at the 1300 block of Broadway across from the old Sonic. Um, and just Steve's talked earlier, the train is number one for us. We want to get another fire station on the west side of the tracks. Um, uh, Deputy Chief Denton here is recently promoted. He used to be the captain at station two, and he can tell you how many times he would go west on the 15th, and, and I hear my guys all the time, they turn the corner from Broadway to 15th and say, we'll be delayed by a train. We have to flip a coin at that point. Is it going to be quicker to turn around, go to Edmond Road, then back west and then drop back south, or is the train going to pass and we can go quicker this way? And it's, it's a you know, and a lot of times they'll start a second engine, which usually is is at point three actually out of station three, they'll be running south. Um, this is kind of what I wanted to show you here. This is the. Which one? Oh, not sure. It's the second slide. It's the second. Okay. This one is with. Yeah, it's Swiss Station. This is our current. So anything in green is our four-minute travel times. Um, the color's kind of off on this. The, the lighter color here, this area here, is going to be more of our A. And then you get up here, this real light color is, is a 12-minute response time. And um, so you kind of see we have we have some holes here. And if you'll flip to that next one, Andy, um, you'll see when you add in Station 6, See squirrels up there. We get a lot more green mm -hmm. when you see this. It kind of fills this in with a little bit of green, and it would do the same on Kelly. We're talking just oh, you know, where this one's shown versus one mile to the west. Uh, we kind of fill that in more. So that that is the, the six. The the station two we have land purchased. If you'll go to the fifth slide, I think. Yeah. 
It's a Google map. We have the land purchased for station number two. It's on 15th Street, Street west of uh, Kelly. <clears throat> So, the whole world's turned upside down. So we're west, we're west of Kelly, north side of 15th Street is where we have land purchased as well. That was purchased in 2007. Um, that will, will really help us in the yeah. southwest side of town, getting that fire station one, get it on the side of the tracks, the west side of the tracks. Uh, two, it gets <coughs> more coverage over there. It spreads station one and station two apart. We have a lot of overlapping on that four minute response time with station one and two being so close together. So it makes that better, kind of expands those boundaries. We're, we, we won't have gaps, but it, it just cut, makes our coverage better. Helps us for, and all this that I'm talking about, ISO is a big thing. Uh, Chris and I, are, we've got our ISO rating June 2nd. ISO evaluator will be here. They come out every every five years, so we will go through this. And this is one of the things they look at, which sets our insurance for everybody's home insurance and business insurance. So we get some bang to, to make that move. Uh, the current station two is is an older building. It's a two bay station. We we'd like to see that increased um, as we expand. Um, we'll probably see that being eventually set up at least for facilities to run it to uh, a, uh, at least two companies out of there. Um, so that so you would retain the current station too if you had the new station? No, we would close okay. that and that's then would be up to uh, you know the city mm -hmm. and to what we do with that is prime land and it could be used for other city functions or it could be so um, it, it's, it's in a good location so um, my, my plan, what I would like to do eventually, is get the new Station 2 built. If you're asking me my wish list, is getting the Station 2 built. Um, and then we have on this list also the remodel of Station Number 1. One of the, one of the things we run into, we have, a, you guys have been to our training facility out of Station 5, it's beautiful. Um, problem with that is I cannot take everybody out there for a training event. Uh, if I want to have a meeting with the entire fire department, the shift guys on duty, we cannot take all our rigs out there because the locale we leave Edmond uncovered, unprotected. Um, so we would like to get Station One remodeled and have a classroom big enough to hold. We're, you know, on duty. Everybody right now we're we're 35. We're fully staffed. With everybody, if I had a 50 to 75 person training room there where we could do events in town and then disperse from there as calls come in, that would be really good. So I'd like to get. The new station two bill, and then we could actually relocate the station one crew to the current station two while we make the remodel there and then bring them back. Um, those are really the three big ones that we would like to do. Um, station, he had uh, station seven, and I didn't do this list by the way, um, but that is a great concept. The, uh, the concept there is, is going out way out east and as we see infrastructure grow out there there's no doubt we'll need it I, honestly as well we see it in my career I don't know um, but there definitely will be needs out that way as you know as time goes on it's the police department also wants something out east and they exactly. want to fix up their um, kind of beat up building that they've got now. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to co-locate those two? Absolutely. Okay. And, that, and that is I didn't know how well you guys got along. So. Yeah, we do actually. Um, we do. We, we actually do have a very good relationship with our PD and, and to even kind of go further is even a uh, working with dispatch with, with them is having a remote location as well, kind of a backup for dispatch if the center of town was hit that we would have a facility that they could actually set up dispatch mm -hmm. operations out there. And that's kind of all in talk <coughs> at this point, but that's the plan. Um, is Does it make sense for you guys to coordinate lake operations as well? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we, we work hand in hand. We, you know, we both have a boat right now, but um, their boat seemed, well, our boat used to be the one always broken because the older <laughs> was a hand-me-down boat. And so we're, we're constantly sharing boats or communicating that, hey, our boat's down and, and we've cross-trained on theirs when before we got our new one, now we're pretty good for a while. Uh, but yeah, we, we work a lot together. That would be the place to do that <coughs> is, is a combination out there. 
this man. How much property do you own to the north on Station 1? To the north, on just the, to the parking lot there. Just to the parking lot? Yeah. yeah we're so very UCO tight. owns the rest? Yep, that is correct. And then to the west, where the, the uh, recreational activity right. pit is, <laughs> otherwise known as volleyball, um, it's, that's UCOs as well. So we're pretty landlocked there. They, I forget what year they gave us that land. Well, we bought it for a dollar, I think, is the way it went. Um, but we just that corner. So we would need to go up with that facility. Um, that would be the plan. It would be put the training room up, up top. As much as my firefighters would like to have a pole, but <laughs> we do not have ankle injuries, so we try to keep them all on one level. Um, questions at this point? Anything? On the far east side, there's a development that hasn't broken ground yet. Canyonwood, is that the name of it? We were, Steve and I were just trying to figure that out. They, there's, at the, is it like Post Road and... It's and Douglas, Douglas and Coffee Creek. Coffee Creek, yeah. And okay. the, I mean, the neighborhoods that are out there, I mean, we fought to get development off the corners out there. So they pushed their commercial to the center. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an oil well... There's a Something dedicated, there's, they, they, they gave this land, Stephen was just talking about that, they gave us, or planted in there a place for a fire station. Yeah, there's 60 acres of commercial there, and that was the pie in the sky, maybe, yeah. of a selling point to get the neighborhood to shut right. up, um, of, of designating land for a, possibly a school, a library, a fire station, police station, um, along with their um, commercial stuff and, there, and then I think there was it was 60 acres that's yeah. in the center of that yeah and that's Covell no <coughs> between <coughs> Doug and Post on Coffee Creek right so you're you're just right over in here um, Woodland Park yes that's the name that's of it. that was the theoretical name and that's Derek <laughs> Turner and Caliber yeah. it's it's all caliber it's all caliber yeah. now okay and, and that I mean be, would be something we look at but I mean as you can see that's going to be two and a half, three miles from where our current yeah. station five. And so, I mean, it the would The development be, itself is 1,260 some odd acres. It's well, almost yeah, two square it's miles. It's yeah. it's when they platted it, we had them put, we had them put a land in there for fire station. Yeah. And that's why city water is that's out what, there okay, now. Okay, great. Uh, that's, that, that's good. Yeah, and that's something you'll, I'm pretty. Thank you, Dina. I was trying to remember where that was. Opening a fire station is, is is one expense. Hiring the personnel to run that fire station so is the expense. Um, so that's something, I mean, you know, looking at call volumes and response times, and, and we have to look at those drivers and, and decide, you know, do we need this? And if, if we can't justify it in, in response times and, and our, you know, in our call volume, then it's, it's something, you know, we, we just wait. And, um, so it, it's you have to kind of take a, a minimalist approach, <coughs> in my opinion, on those as much as you can, as long as we're able to, to meet our turnout times, response times. Um, we're not getting too many concurrent calls, and we will be looking at other ways of, of helping ourselves out with um, potentially, like we're talking about the new station two running um, some lighter EMS units out of there when we get the chance, the opportunity to to, to free up that engine where we can. Kind of supplement Emson's crew with we send two people and they're sending two people. Uh, those those type of opportunities will help us manning wise. It cuts down on our costs. So there's there's other avenues to look at. Yeah. And would you be able to do enhancements to fire station one or um, have the future fire station without additional? Not without the, the additional funding. We, you know, we, you guys are very familiar. We get the 30 30 percent from general fund, and then the, the quarter cent sales tax. Right now, on the the 30 percent fund, um, right at 90 percent is personnel services. It comes out of that 30 percent. That that goes to <coughs> the, the overall roll up cost of personnel. Um, so we not quite, but essentially everything else is operated off the sales tax. One of the things in the mayor, after budget hearings the other day, approached me and approached Mr. Stevens um, that we would like to start doing in regards to Fire Station 2 is 
uh, start some preliminary planning, get with an architect. We can pay for that out of our budget. You know, it, it's a lower ticket item, obviously. But start getting some, some planning and hard cost, really what we're looking at. We're, we're estimating, I was checking with Oklahoma City, they just finished a new station, and it was right at three million without the land, which we already have the land. Uh, and a very similar station that what we would be looking at. So I think it's in there at 3.5, but I hope to be closer to that 30. Mm -hmm. oh, I got a question, I'm sorry. Um, other questions? So that, that four minute versus eight minute time, I assume wow. there's studies that say that extra four minutes is crucial. Yes, exactly. That NFPAs, um, they, they really look at it, they don't even look at it from a medical call standpoint. It, it's a structure fire standpoint. Um, uh, or you know, structure fires and so yeah they look at that and the, the amount of fires that you'll have within the first four minutes and eight and that's where they pulled it out they they, they came up with that number um, and then it is also with the insurance service it kind of gets driven that way too um, they, they tie into that as well so it's it is interesting um, to to, uh, get in that. Remind me the, the percent of calls you get that are fire related versus medical. We're we're still hovering 77 to 80 percent, Chris. Does that sound? I can't remember even last year's exact number. Yeah, but right right at the 80 percent mark is medical related. Is is our EMS related calls? Um, we. <coughs> We, were, we are very fortunate. We don't have a lot of structured fires. Um, you know, we, we have newer homes. We have smart homes. I mean, it's bad for anybody not living in Emma, but we do have intelligent residents. They take care of their properties. They, you, know, you can look at just our, our amount of residents, their demographics with college degrees. They just they blow the candle out before they leave the house that night. And so that helps us tremendously. Um, so we, uh, we are blessed there. Uh, we do make a lot of medical rides, and uh, you know, we're still responding with everything that, that IMSA is doing. We have made a few changes in our nursing homes uh, just as of late, where medical calls are divided into two priorities. Priority one being the most urgent, and the priority two, which may be, can be bad lab results. The lab results came in, and, and I need to go in to see the doctor. I'm like, I'm like whatever's raised. Um, in the nursing homes, we've stopped running on the priority two calls. So basically, they're a transport call, um, and we've just we're running lights and sirens, which you heard Steve talking about the opticoms and the congestion that causes and the risk and taking a rig out of service. And when there's medically trained staff already there, and we're getting there, and they're handing us a sheet and saying, "Here's all their vitals. They're going to room 368 at Mercy Hospital." Now we're sitting here, and now we're tied up. We're waiting on IMSA by contract. IMSA has 20 minutes to respond to that call. And so we're there now for that 20 minutes. And the guys, there's not a lot they can do. And a lot of times, it's something that really isn't, it's not urgent. So we are working on that. <coughs> Oklahoma City has gotten away from responding to all priority two calls, even in private residence. We do not want that. We want somebody there. I don't you want to say if you stub your toe, but we do want to be in our, our, our citizens' homes if they're hurt. We don't want them waiting. If they feel the need to call 911, we want to be there quick, and then they can make the determination. If they want us there or even him, so they can always turn him so away. Um, so we did try that for a short period of time, and it, it wasn't working good. So that was over a year ago. But uh, medical takes a lot of calls. But it's a good service that we provide. We run the ALS engines. We have paramedics on our engines. We're able to innovate, push IV drugs, start IVs, obviously. Uh, so we can do everything that the ambulance can do except put them on the cot and take them to the hospital. Yes, sir. Chief, um, your funding now comes up from a quarter percent sales tax. Am I correct on that? Yes, sir, as well as 30% from the general. No. What our, what our task force here is to do the extension of the half percent sales tax or do you anticipate some of this money to come to the fire department? The extension of the half cent? Um, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm really saying is 
Are, have you got enough funding now to operate the way you've been operating? And and uh, so, so, uh, but we keep talking about the fire. In this group, we keep talking about the fire department, and we keep talking about the streets and things like that. And uh, I, I was on the anticipation this was new ideas. <coughs> Well, I think this additional funding will allow right. you to have the additional station and to renovate one. Exactly. Yeah, our, we can continue to operate and we'll continue to operate off our budget that we have set up now and for next fiscal year and so forth. Um, the monies to do these additional projects is, it would be, but we would be asking for some assistance. Just we don't have that amount there to, to take three million or three and a half million to build a well, station. Okay. We, we, because I was involved in the, the sale of the two properties to the fire department uh -huh. in 2007. We, had, we didn't have to <coughs> go for funding from anybody else because the fire department had a reserve of that amount to pay for those properties at that point in time. Right. So, uh, Is there a reserve now? Since 2007, how much money have you saved up and how much do you have in your, <laughs> in your war chest <laughs> to open up project number two? Our, oh gosh, and you have to forgive me and I'll get you the exact number. <coughs> I'm trying to think what number. our exact reserve is. It's, it should be around 2.7, Steve. Does that sound yeah. about right? I mean, we have an established reserve, and you, know, you don't want to try to plan on dropping down your reserve yeah. all the way down. I think so that's. We still have our reserves in there. Well, we I think the approach has been that they can they can fund their operating expenses. They can probably fund uh, any equipment renovations to some degree. But if you talk about a brand new station, the the funding stream isn't isn't yeah. geared to handle that. And then staff because it's a big expense too once you start. The well, we didn't, well, we didn't run their fund down to zero when we bought those two properties either. Nowhere close. Well, no, it's got, there's balances, and, and we'll get uh, we'll get you harder. I think it's about that 10.7, um, and we're in exactly, you mentioned apparatus, we're, you know, we're looking at a- the Fire trucks aren't cheap. No, so we're, our, our aerial ladder we're looking at replacing is, you know, uh, we bought it in 2001 for right at 700,000, and it's up to today's dollars, 1.2. Do we have any seven story building yet? We just the I always call it the Ramada. It's how long I've been here. The Ramada, but the yeah. UCO <laughs> Plaza uh, is still is still our tallest building today. Um, but there are some interesting concepts on that. We looked at a rig uh, two days ago that they brought through. They are changing, and we can get 107 foot on a lot smaller chassis, and uh, and it actually gets it down in that 700,000 range. So yeah. we're kind of excited about that as innovation comes. Yes, sir. So um, if with the income that you have right now and the quarter percent, you would have to string your projects that you really want to do out over, what, 10 years or five years or? Because yeah. so, the real question for us is, should we extend that tax <coughs> so that we can do these projects quicker? Right. And obviously fire is something we want to stay on top of. Sure. To answer, yes, I mean, we could do it. I mean, I don't know. I'd have to put a pencil to it exactly to see how far that runs out, um, you know, with the with the relocation of twos, we're not talking adding any manpower. So that's that's a property of one-time expense once we make it, of course, maintain it. But it's not like adding a fire station. Station six, you're looking at a minimum of, of 12 personnel hiring, 12 new people for four for guys per shift. Um, so that's an addition of, of 12 new people. You've got promotions at different ranks. So it gets starts getting into back into that. So is that going to put you upside down on your thirty percent? Exactly. No, it, it would. Right now, it would not. It okay. would still keep us. We would still be within our range. So you just need capital improvements to build it. Yeah, for for the station two at this point, and, 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 well, and then six, five it, or and six. Then six, right? Uh, the the vehicles we have been, we have. I think you're familiar with our fire fleet fund or the fleet fund in general, um, but we have put money in for engine sure. six and seven. We started go ahead and plug in, and it, basically you're paying it forward, so we're, we're pretending like they're here and we're, we're putting in that money uh, to start building that fund up, but, but not actually showing to purchase them for right. a few years out, so we're trying to get ahead of that. So the original fire station two that's right next to UCO, 
Uh, that's one. Well, next oh, that's one. Yeah. Okay, so the w number two that you're going to move uh -huh. on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? One on Broadway by the Blue Hippo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, what are you going to do with the old one? Um, we would turn it. The city would decide what to do with it at that point. They Probably could dispose of the asset. Yes. Hmm. That's, and that's what I, I mean, it's probably a fairly valuable piece of property yeah. right there. So I don't know if, if you sell that station Is it a wash? To, to Pete, who's got a lot of money. Right. Um, <laughs> if you sell it to him, who gets that money? So it would go back to the 30%? It would go into the budget? We have a, a separate reserve fire fund, money that goes from the 30% Plus the sales tax goes all into one fund. Okay, so you get to, you know, use that yeah. asset. Okay. Yeah. And that could be, you know, that money then potentially go to Station Six or, or wherever. And we could kind of so that would roll help. that up, snowball they that. Said, we're here when we say we wanted to remodel one. Right. Which basically means raising the building and starting over. I would think. For the most part, that and building was built in 1976. And then they got the up on Kelly, by Cross Timbers. That's start from scratch. 15th and Kelly start from scratch, but they have the only, the only thing they have is the land. Cody, do you have a question? Yeah, and it's, yes, sir. it's very unrelated to these other questions. So. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, how, what kind of resources do you expend on, I guess, mutual aid to these other outlying areas? Like, you know, like South, Southern Logan County, which is mm -hmm. wildfire central until maybe not this year. Right. Because we got soaked. But sure. Is it, we, is it we, a big cost to the department to? It's not a bit, other outlying areas. It's usually not a, a tremendous cost. The, the, the <coughs> big events are usually FEMA reimbursed, and so we try to play by their rules as much as we can, send the <coughs> duty personnel uh, to those events because they will reimburse them for not only for uh, the man hours but for the truck. They have a schedule set up. A brush truck, a brush mm -hmm. pumper gets a different fee than a tanker or an engine. Mm -hmm. um, so we do take advantage of recouping that money when it's a, a declared emergency. Of course, not all of them are. Uh, but we do a lot of mutual aid. We, <coughs> we do, and then we reciprocate from that. Um, you know, we have three brush pumpers in Edmond, so we strongly rely on Woodcrest, Deer Creek, Oak Cliff, uh, Guthrie at times to come back into our community because, uh, you know, a, a three brush pumpers isn't going to, a, a large fire, we're not touching it. So we, we strongly, we, we do that, but we do reciprocate. So we feel like in the long run, we come out pretty fair on that. We're right at 7 o'clock. Yeah. Really appreciate you coming in, Chief Paul. Absolutely. I uh, hope job. I answered your questions. And Phil, if you feel, please feel free to email me if you have any more questions or anything I can answer for you. I'm happy to help. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is to talk about what we're going to talk about next time. So uh, I think we'll have a similar lineup to have some folks presenting to us. And we'll try to keep it shorter. But we had kind of two biggies. Um, okay. so, I think parts should be one of them for sure. Okay, great. When we got that scheduled, and we'll look at Steve Wilson. Super. Steve, do you think we could get these guys a tour of the public safety center? Sure. Or what? The Public Safety Center. Oh, love that. Yes. We're going to go, the CIP committee wants to go look oh, at yeah, it, so I was awesome. thinking maybe this committee would like to go too. Yep. Oh, yeah. Steve Thompson that. really lives for that, so we'll get him to. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Right. Yeah, yeah, we'll does. see if we can, if you could come, it'd be easier if you could come in a little earlier. Yeah. Yeah. While the things are still kind of opened up over there. Right. So we'll see if we can work something for your next meeting. That's great. Okay. And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. <clears throat>